Anigaishimas. Welcome to Cliff's Wujo. A Wujo is a place where the Wujo arts are practiced, as a dojo is a place in which the martial arts are practiced. The Wu arts are all things not allowed in mainstream media. Wu is all talk not fit for polite discussion. Wu is the other half of what makes us human. Good morning. Uh, today is March 31. It's 8.07 a.m. Pacific uh, Coast Time. Uh, North American continent. Um, planet Terra. In uh, our particular solar system. Whatever its name is. And that's an interesting uh, thing to start thinking about. Because uh, if our solar system has a name, it means it's been referenced from outside. Um, this may actually be... Carved the solar system name. There's there appears to be a labeling system that's carved into several petroglyphs that are uh, both in Australia, found in in Australia that I'm aware of, and in um, the Micronesian islands. And some of the petro all of the petroglyphs have, that I'm referring to have a central core to them in which there is a symbolic representation of the sun with the little uh, familiar. Um, uh, circle with the center point in it and the radiating uh, uh, solar uh, arm, so to speak. And then there is a, a symbol, uh, clearly an alphabetic symbol that's attached to the petroglyph uh, referencing the solar mass. Uh, this is interesting because where it was uh, seen in Australia, and I don't know if, it, know if it's even still available anymore, was... Um, on the southern coast in a very uh, desolate area. I'm not very familiar with Australia. I know about Ayers Rock and, you know, the kind of stuff that someone might see on TV here in North America. Uh, I'm much more familiar with the Polynesia and having read about the islands and so forth. But the descriptor area for the Australian part was that the petroglyph was in a cave in which there were a number of, let's just say, out-of-place artifacts that shouldn't have been there, Egyptian and so on. Anyway, so, uh, the day starts out, uh, I get up, I get tea, I sit down, start looking at things, I get an email about this particular, uh, story that, uh, Alex Jones has got out about a me movie produced by, um, a bunch of people, uh, directed by Cameron, I guess, and the name of the movie is Prometheus, and the subject of the movie is a prequel to the series of movies called Aliens, a uh, very scary show. Uh, I don't like uh, horror movies because of the effect it has on you later on when you have to process all this crud out and your mind is not able to determine what is real and what is not. That's in the Bardo. In any event, so uh, I go and I watch Alex Jones have a very peculiar rant. Now, uh, Alex Jones has to, be, in my opinion, has to be given proper credit for his um, uh, approach to the Bohemian Grove and the really nice way he did it uh, using the cure and maintenance of the wayward mariner approach in, in case he get, was caught trespassing. So anyway, so he gets proper respect for that. I dislike him for his uh, Israel shall do no evil attitude, and I dislike him for the fact that he yells at me all the time when I, when I watch his videos. He does not have a nice, calm, moderate voice. Now, I appreciate that he's getting whipped up and that he's emotionally um, involved in the stories and so on, so, so I'm not really giving him a hard time about that. It's just that I have very sensitive hearing, and, I, and so he uh, can be a little bit um, uh, hard to take. In any event, though, so here he is. He's uh, giving this um, description of the Prometheus movie. Uh, you can go and see it on InfoWars. It's really worth watching his description because it is not a typical Alex Jones rant. Uh, I find that very unusual. This is uh, almost reverential in terms of how he's presenting the information. The information that he is presenting is about a movie called Prometheus. Now, the mythical story of Prometheus is one of the demigods who brings a fire down to humans because he, he has compassion. He suffers from the compassion disease, plus he's pissed at the other gods. And so he brings fire down to us and gives us fire. Basically brings us technology. That's the theme within the movie Prometheus. But there's another archetype and a hidden subtext there that even Alex Jones is not discussing. And that's what we're going to go into here today. So it will make sense to you what I'm about to discuss if you go and listen to the Alex Jones rant. You may want to stop here, go listen to Alex Jones, and then come back. In any event, though, so uh, Prometheus, in the mythical sense, is um, uh, punished by the gods for his crime of giving us technology, which makes us equal to them. That was the crime, right? Was keeping it, was helping us break out of servitude. 
Um, uh, so it wasn't that, oh, you know, you went down and assaulted a sheep or something, you know. It was that, oh, you went on down and told these slaves how to be equal to the people that are enslaving them. And this is not a good thing, and so you turned on us because of your compassion. And the gods, of course, have no compassion, which you'll note if you read the Bible. And uh, they... Uh, especially all that Old Testament crud. Um, uh, but um, the gods, so they chain Prometheus, poor bastard, to a rock and have these uh, birds come and eat his guts out every day. And in the night he's regrown uh, through agony of the flesh regrowing. And then in the morning they come and tear his guts out again. And this goes on and on and on forever is the uh, punishment. Now, the interesting part about this, though, is the deeper archetypes that go all the way back because Prometheus... And, I'm, and I'll give away the um, ultimate story here later on. Prometheus is an archetype for the return, and it's also an archetype for the jackal. Now, the word the jackal will make a lot more sense when you go and start looking into the work of um, uh, Shannon uh, Doherty. I th- or Doherty, let me check here. Um, Shannon, where are you there? Anyway, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go, after listening to Alex Jones and and the rest of this, you're going to want to go and look up a a tribe called the Dogon and a myth about a people called the Nummo, N-U-M-M-O. The best possible source for this is a book uh, that was written about conversations. I think the actual title is Conversations With, and then the guy's name is Otomele, O-T-T-O-M-E-L-E. Or M-E-L-E, yes. Otomele, Conversations with Otomele. And the woman who has the um, uh, written a, a new version, that book was from a, a study in Africa that was done in the 1930s before World War II, uh, Conversations with Otomele. And uh, Shannon Dory, D-O-R-E-Y, uh, S-H-A-N-N-O-N is her name, has written a book um, about the Nummo and the Dogon and made the myth much more accessible to modern English readers. The uh, Conversations with Otomele is in English, but it was from a Frenchman uh, who was doing archaeological and anthropological research at the time in uh, Mali, and he came across the uh, tribe of the Dogon and this uh, myth of the Nummo. Now, what's really cool about the Dogon is that in spite of pressures from the Islam- Islamists to convert to Islam or die, um, they chose to keep their tradition alive and not convert to Islam, and they moved. And so they moved clear across to Africa to get away from the pressures that were attempting to get them to shed their particular ritual history. The reason their ritual history was important to all of us, let alone them, is that it is the most complete encapsulation that we have today of the actual story of the creation of humanity and what occurred. And Otomele tells all of this to this Frenchman because Otomele, a blind fellow, knows he's dying. He's the last of their shaman. And he knows that the world has changed and it is now time to get the word of the Nummo out and explain what had occurred and, and where we're all at and why all this is going on. The reason that I'm bringing this up is because apparently, according to Alex Jones's description, the movie Prometheus is a very, very, very dark telling of the Nummo story. So uh, my approach is to say the Nummo are not as dark as being shown in the uh, movie. Uh, the Nummo have their own issues, in which we can go into it at great length, um, discussing for hours. But the uh, question I have as a result of seeing the Alex Jones thing about the movie Prometheus, I was vaguely aware of, of the name of the movie and that there was a movie made, but I, I never go to theater. Uh, I never watch films if they uh, anymore. I don't watch them even on TV. So it is beyond... Um, uh, my r- realm of operation that I would even see the thing, so I have no interest in the movie until I happen to see Alex Jones going on about it and realized what was happening here. The, in the movie, they're telling you, and Alex Jones will tell you, that the core of the movie is to out the secret of how humans came out. Now, it is not dark and bad and evil the way that either Alex Jones or the uh, director of the movie are trying to make it out to be. The Nummo had their own problems. They caused problems here on Earth. But they are also a very compassionate, and however ugly they may be, which you will discover as you go into the books by um, uh, Shannon Dory and then the description of the Nummo from the Otomeli uh, discussion, uh, they are not nice-looking guys. However, 
they're really cool, and they're they're not necessarily our enemies. I say necessarily because there is in the past a conflict between the Nemo and uh, some residents here on Earth. It gets really complex and it gets really complicated because since the Nemo went away, maybe millions of years ago, we just don't know, uh, and left us to progress. It was a deliberate thing called Experiment Three, I think. Um, uh, to have us progress to, to reach back into our immortality. Um, when they left, and since then, there's been all kinds of nasty bastards coming here screwing around. And we've also aided that condition by having our uh, local psychopathic nut jobs get their hands on too much electricity, and they've been causing problems in the materium, cutting rifts where there shouldn't be, and allowing other nasty bastards to show up. So with the uh, plethora of nasty bastards uh, polluting the area here, our local environment's gotten very complicated. Uh, it's so complicated as to make uh, the Byzantine courts look um, pedantic and childlike. We don't know who the players are. They're not, ident not identifying themselves because of their issues with each other. We're the central focus, but not really. I mean, we're maybe 51% of their focus. All of these kind of things going on. Shifting alliances, um, alliances of uh, convenience, and uh, many levels of basics screwing around with us. But that all aside, there is some really cool stuff about the Nemo myth. Um, I'm not a mythologist, but I want to know what's going on, and I can research like nobody's business. I mean, that's really my only talent, is I can teach myself things very, very um, effectively. And so I've researched and I've researched, and i found that the, at the base core of all of the myths of the planet, including all of the myths of the um, secret societies, the Masons, <coughs> Opus Dei, the Church, the all three religions, the faith-based, the... Um, uh, uh, multi-characteristic religions, a uh, view of mater materium, um, you know, the uh, Hindus, the Buddhists, etc. Uh, all of these religions have in their core expressions of, of the Nemo myth. None more so, um, uh, how do I want to say it, focused than what we see in the uh, Vedas and the Punas, uh, uh, Puranas uh, texts of the um, Hindu societies where they have a myth about this guy called Manu who is, it's basically the Noah myth redone, the flood and all of this, and I'll get to that in a half a second. This is going to be a long one. Anyway, so um, uh, Manu uh, is a, a guy who lives on a coast of India. He's uh, out doing his business there. He's a coastal worker. He fishes and this kind of thing. And one day he catches this fish and the fish says, oh, oh, don't eat me. Throw me back into the sea and save me and I will give you a great blessing. And Manu is, you know, basically shocked to shit that the fish talks to him. And it's a pretty ugly fish anyway, which goes back to the Nemo myth again. And so he says, okay, no way I'm eating you. And he pitches the fish back into the sea. And the fish turns around and talks to him and says, okay, here's what you do, dude. Uh, you got to go locate this woman who knows the names and the uses of all the plants. And you got to put her in a rowboat. And you got to go over to this point just off the um, uh, tip of India here. And you got to sit there and you better do it really damn quick because there's a great flood coming. And so Manu does this and he goes and he gets the the woman who knows the names of um, and uses of all the plants and they sit in his rowboat and they sit there and there's a great flood and he's saved along with the woman now in the hindu myth uh the 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 planetary humanity is not wiped out and it's quite absurd that all of uh, the earth could be covered by a giant flood under those circumstances simply because of the land mass and so on. Within the Hindu myth, there's lots of people killed, society is destroyed, and things are terribly upset, and most of the elders are also destroyed. And basically anybody who knew anything uh, that would allow civilization to be rebuilt is pretty much shell-shocked from the trauma of it all, except there's the more or less reasonably sane Manu and the woman who knew the names of and uses of all the plants. And so they set out teaching the uh, poor remnants of humanity how to come back to themselves. Now, the really cool part of the, uh, the Manu myth in the Hindu um, text is that it goes into some great detail uh, about the trauma component of it and how devastating that was to the survivors and that what Manu brought to this was that little tiny bit of foreknowledge that allowed his mind, his consciousness, to grasp the idea of the up, 
uh, of the pending upheaval and to basically shield himself and the woman by foreknowledge of the pending catastrophe and the the subs- and thus lessen the subsequent trauma on themselves and they were able to there thereafter go out and rebuild another really cool part uh, part of this in the Nummo myth of the uh, in the Hindu version was that Manu is not alone there are references in some of the uh, other Hindu texts to the fact that at the same time that Manu was getting the warning other Nummo, other fish, aquatic beings, were out on the coastland uh, all over the uh, planet Earth, which was much smaller at the time, uh, telling all the peoples of the world, basically, get your ass to high ground and watch out, big flood coming. Now, what's really interesting about that is the wording and some of the characteristics of that wording are similar in the Indian text, translated into English, of course, and Egyptian, Polynesian, uh, Australian myths, and local Salish myths, all about the aquatic beings saving everybody's butts. So there's a, a tradition level there that spans an area of the planet not normally looked at as a reference point for uh, Western uh, mythology. And because, uh, uh, mainly, by the way, people really ignore the Polynesians, and they should not, because Polynesian, of course, means many islands, but uh, the many islands, uh, nations, peoples, that extend actually from B.C. Columbia uh, all the way down to Australia, are a very unique group of individuals that conquered and uh, explored and and settled. They didn't have to conquer it, but they explored and settled an area of the planet that was greater than the British Empire controlled at its height in terms of total square footage. And they did it with no metal. And they invented technologies that were truly astounding and and so integrated into nature that when the technology was done with, it sort of dissolved back into nature and we have no record of it. The few we do have records of are staggering. Uh, One of them I happen to be building, which is a Pacific Proa weight to windward. And this is a level of technology that I'm using modern materials, and I admit there's a few bits of metal in mine. Uh, but um, the level of engineering is highly sophisticated and has only been recently duplicated. So um, these myths that extend throughout the uh, Polynesian area validate the myth level uh, detail that's within the Hindu myth of the Namo, which goes to support the Dogon's myths of the Namo. Now, bear in mind that Dogon tribe used to be, even though they're on the western side of Africa now, they used to be on the eastern side of Africa. And they shared the uh, ocean area with the Hindu. And they had the the other supporting components in their myth that actually point to Manu. Um, but, okay, so let's get a real quick encapsulation of what the Namo are and what happened and all of that, just so that you have the basic story down and you can go and do the research and then understand what Alex Jones is going on and why the secret societies are all whipped up and why I think that something very, very, very major is being announced in this movie, Prometheus. Phew. Okay, so here's the story. Um, there are these guys that are aquatic beings that we would, by our definition, say are pretty ugly-looking fish lumpy, you know, a, a huge wide uh, tail. Uh, they got a pretty ugly face, but they got hands. They got arms with uh, a little little uh, fingery kind of things on the front of them. And they sort of have little proto feet off of the back of their tails. But they've got really big brains and they're very sophisticated and they know how to work uh, metals and other materials within aquatic and, and any other kind of environment. Plus they're really old, plus they're immortal. And so that's really cool. But the Nummos had a problem. They lived in Sirius which is the real tie here because the Dogon tribe knew about uh, the details of the Sirius star system that we are only still discovering and they know details that we have yet to discover and they knew them before we even had um, any real understanding of our local near space let alone any far reaches of space. The Dogon people knew this information uh, potentially thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago. And uh, they also uh, knew things about genetics that we didn't even have a description of DNA, and they they knew all about it. It was all encoded into their, their rituals and their mythology. Further, they also know about a technology that we don't know, but although maybe our military knows, and we'll just call it the LC or liquid copper technology, LCT. Anyway, that was how the Numo moved around, was this stuff called uh, liquid copper. 
Anyway, so the Nummo live in Sirius, and they got themselves a really nice uh, water planet. They, they've got everything going for them. It's really cool, but they've got issues with their star system, and they have no pie. Uh, so it's awful hard to bake underwater. And so they, they decided they, they just had to get the hell out of there, and they sp- spotted our planet, our solar system, and they knew that they could come on over here and fix things up and uh, make it uh, really cool for themselves. And so they did that. They trucked on over here. And they settled in on uh, Earth and what used to be the fifth planet. And we can give it a name. It doesn't matter. We can call it Bob. So it was planet Bob. Anyway, uh, they settled in there and they started terraforming Earth. And their myth from that point on, it gets really simple. They said that they came here and found some life forms. They took the DNA of that life form and blended it in with their own DNA to create a much more advanced life form because it was their intention to have that life form uh, express their form of immortality. And so they needed to have their DNA in there, which knows how to do this. And so we actually have within us DNA from the Nummo way in the base of our stuff. And that's why we're really, really um, attractive to these other guys that are coming in from the rifts, the the holes. Now let's stop for a second and say that the Nummo don't travel by rifts in uh, time or space. The Nummo are hugely smart, time is not an issue for them, and they know how to shove their self through the interstellar medium, something that is, I find just staggering uh, because of the amount of energy that is required to do that and the effects of doing that are absolutely huge. But see, they don't bother to go through the rifts in time stuff and and, and uh, deal with the uh, issues of the ever-present uh, now and all, um, the omnipresent uh, consciousness uh, conflicts that occur as a result of that. So they just get in their spaceship, and since they're immortal, it's like, okay, we don't care. It'll take four million years, but what the hell? We'll learn something along the way. And so they just go. Then they came here to to our solar system and they started monkeying around and they created a fairly rich life form base on Earth. And this is what they called Experiment 1. And so then they they got a really nice life form base here that could support all kinds of nifty critters and evolution and all this sort of deal. And then they create their Experiment 1. Now, Experiment 1 is actually the word. (coughs) Every time you hear them talk about uh, the word in Otomele or um, uh, Shannon Doherty discussing it, they're talking about DNA, because DNA actually is a language, yeah, yeah, which is really cool for linguists. Anyway, though, um, so uh, experiment one didn't quite work out. Exper- experiment one was an attempt to create a being that would be native to our solar system. Now, this is very important because you cannot go and live in another solar system because of what's known in in <coughs> my way of thinking here, because of um, what I'm terming the uh, in, ever-present now and the omnipresent consciousness conflict. Uh, basically, you've got to be synced in to the complexity of that particular solar system uh, from the get-go, or you can't really survive there for long. And it causes real issues. The further we get away from Earth, for instance, as a terrestrial body... Uh, our physical form will have more and more problems unless we deal with these conflicts that are created at this much more esoteric, energetic level. And the Nummo know this, which is why they avoid all that by shoving themselves around through space. You avoid huge amounts of these problems, but nonetheless, it's really going to get you, especially if you're very long-lived. And so the Nummo couldn't really stay here. They had to adapt themselves, adapt part of their life form and their immortality to this local environment. And they did that, and they created Experiment 1. Now, Experiment 1... Um, uh, is created, let's just say, was born, um, and, oh, okay, all right, let me back up. Sorry, uh, big deal here. The Nummo, besides being aquatic, are, are amphibians, and they're, uh, hermaphrodite. Actually, they're, they're not really hermaphrodite. They are female, and sometimes some of them can occasionally become male as a necessary method of, uh, uh syzygy in production of new uh, genetic material so that you don't spiral into this inbreeding issue. And so so at some point in their uh, evolutionary history, some of the Nummo as individuals will become will transit from female to male in a temporary state uh, for the purposes of reproduction. And then they'll transit back to female. So all of our myths about uh, the female encoding, the female central archetype, the mother goddess, all of this kind of stuff, I'll go back to the fact that the, the Nummo in, in their sexual identity are basically 
uh, more or less continuously female, except some, some of them are not. And it varies under the circumstances who, who, who's f- a male and the, all of this kind of stuff. Anyway, though, so, so here are these uh, aquatic uh, amphibious fish beings that are female come to this planet. They've got water here. Everything's really cool. And they create Experiment 1. Well, there was a screw-up. And we don't know the details of the screw up, but experiment one did not go well. And the being that was created from that, the Nummo called the jackal, uh, in Otomeli's terms. Now, Otomeli, of course, had to, they had to characterize it by the beings that they knew within Africa, so they termed it the jackal. <coughs> if you look at the Nummo myth in the Hindus, um, uh, framework, the result of the error of experiment one is uh, creates a black cat, okay, the the puma, uh, which they didn't even know about. As far as I know, they don't have black cats, jaguars, or pumas, or, or anything like that in, in India. I have to check that out. In any event, though, so uh, here we go. Uh, this this jackal being is uh, created. The idea is that the Nummo will transfer their immortality, which we won't go into uh, how that process occurs into this new race of beings and then the existent Nummo that did all this work were going to hightail it out to the Pleiades and start all over there because they found some water worlds there. Anyway, so they're doing this work and uh, Jackal is born and he sort of grows up and they find they got a problem because the Jackal is not female. He is perpetually male. Further, he's mortal. And they discover this, immor- this that he has no immortality and no link to the immortality, no possibility of, of connecting to the immortality as he does at, as the fellow is reaching into his early um, maturity, however long that is. Years doesn't matter. Let's just say that he'd be like 22, 23 years old. And so he basically goes batshit and uh, decides he's just going to get the hell out of there. And he grabs one of the Nummo's liquid uh, copper-fueled spaceships and takes off. Only, of course, he's a dumbass, and he can't really control it, and it crashes. It takes up off the planet, uh, swings out there, and comes back and crashes in on Earth. And this is the first of the traumas. There were three of them. Uh, So, um, the first of the trauma was the huge, incredible level of planetary ecological catastrophe that was caused by the jackal uh, crashing the spaceship into Earth. Now, the jackal may have done so deliberately. We don't know. He may have just committed suicide in the um, mental upset of discovering himself not to be immortal like the Nemo. So, after the crash... Uh, the Nummo pop their heads up out of the ocean and say, basically, oh, crap, we got a real problem here. And so they gather up um, uh, what was known as the cube. And this is a really cool part of it. I mean, this goes to the Ark of the Covenant and the um, uh, infinite leaves that you find referenced in the books in the uh, Vedas all the time about these infinite leaves of knowledge that can be stored in a space that takes no space and all this other stuff, basically pointing out that all you really need is the information. You don't need the actual stuff about DNA. You just need to ha- know how was categorized. And you read in Otomele about how they stored all this stuff in this cube that could store uh, as many million rhinos as you want, or um, as many elephants as you want, or whales, or whatever. Because, of course, it's not actually storing them, it's just storing the information. And so it alludes to an electronic storage media, describes it, and all of this kind of stuff. Anyway, so the uh, Nummo grab all their information, they grab some of their DNA samples, and they knew they had to beat feet, which they did, they or little tiny feet, and move their tails, and they got off the planet. And there were some survivors, and this is where things get really uh, a little freaky, because there were some level of, um, uh, I don't want to say proto-human, but there was some level of uh, other beings here at the time the Nummo were doing these experiments that they were rather dismissive of. Uh, these beings were not um, necessarily immortal, and uh, kind of creeped them out a bit, I guess. But And I don't know the, the lineage on that, and the point of the story is to not get too diverted. So uh, so there were some survivors, but the Nummo had to get away r- really quickly. Now, the Nummo, uh, as a species, are filled with compassion, and it's really upset them that they had uh, botched Experiment 1, created a mortal being that caused a planetary-level disaster. Actually, they may have even been solar system-wide uh, because of some other stuff in the Otomele story that seems to hint that way and other confirmation in other parts of the myth. Anyway, so um, they go back to Sirius with their uh, material, 
and uh, they decide, all right, they've really screwed things up. They got to fix it up. So they, what they decided they would do, would they would create uh, experiment two. And experiment two was the creation of what is known as the eight ancestors, and the scrubbing. And the scrubbing was when they sent a group back to Earth, and they covered the planet with what we can describe of as is basically some kind of a corrosive foam. That, uh, and this is the core of the flood myth again, and it and it cleaned up the um, ecological disaster caused by the destruction of the Nemo ship. Again, there were people that survived, or beings that, uh, you know, of some form, life form, that survived the cleansing of the planet by this foam. It was never intended to eradicate everything. Its goal was to get rid of this peculiar form of radiation that was the result of the crash. In the meantime, the Nemo are back on Sirius, and they create the eight human ancestors. And we'll just describe them that way from right now. They're the eight ancestors. There, we'll number them one through eight. Nemo had a really interesting plan because they were, they had figured out what went wrong in experiment one. And they, um, uh, knew how to correct the immortality issue. And they did so in experiment two. And they did so by creating, uh, these eight ancestors that were basically, let's just say quasi immortal. Uh, immortal in a way that we wouldn't think of, but, uh, nonetheless immortal in their, in their understanding of it. And the Nummo had a plan. They were going to produce a series of, uh, beings on Earth from each of these, uh, from the ancestor pairings. And they had specific genetics intended to be crossed. So they wanted to cross ancestor number one. Now all these beings are female, mind you, but some of them can be male as is needed. Uh, because they were sort of like the Nummo. They were, they were, um, uh, uh, a changeable female, uh, being. I don't want to say hermaphrodite because that really doesn't cover the term and in, in, it gets into the uh, other gender and sexual issues that are just not present with the Nummo. And so here's what the Nummo had intended. They'd had uh, ancestor number one was going to mate with ancestor number eight, uh, number two with number seven, uh, number three with number six, uh, and number four with number five. And this would produce basically four progeny that as they mated, would create the um, new immortal uh, human being race. But, ah, damn, there was a screw-up. Uh, two of the ancestors fell in love. And this was number one and two, so it was out of sequence. Nemo didn't want those genetics to mate. And unfortunately, during the process of these uh, beings falling in love, they mated, and they produced a child. And further gets complicated because both of them were in their male phase at the time that they uh, fell in love. And one of them flipped into female phase in order that they might mate and they ended up with this child. And the Nummo are horrified. Absolutely just freaked. Because they know that their experiment number two is likely as doomed as experiment number one and what the hell went on. They're immortal. This kind of crap shouldn't happen. So um, uh, they want to abort the child of the uh, Ancestor 1 and Ancestor 2, these two men, uh, one of whom is pregnant. Anyway, so um, uh, the eight ancestors are eight proto-human ancestors, uh, all of whom are carrying a central core of terrestrial DNA that the Nummo do not share, felt an allegiance among themselves uh to each other that was greater than their allegiance to the Nummo under the circumstances. And so the eight ancestors decided as a group, whatever the dynamics, any of that, we don't know, uh, that they were going to say no, they weren't going to allow this abortion to occur, and they stole a spaceship and came back to Earth. Now, the Nummo may have chased them. We don't know about that. Uh, there is another reappearance of the Nummo later on. Uh, but so this was experiment number two. So experiment number two ended as a failure. Experiment number two brought the eight ancestors to Earth. And ancestors number one and two gave birth along the way or when they arrived here uh, on the planet. The latter, I think, actually. And here's an interesting thing. These are two males. Uh, this is where we get all of our prohibitions against uh, homosexuality and all this kind of stuff. The deep um, uh, trauma-connected uh, ethos of it all within the heterosexual community and all the other. Because, see, at one level, the two males here who fell in love and had a child uh, had a perfect right to do that. The universe is as it is, and things occur as they do. 
Um, that is just the way materium is. But at the same time, uh, they were the uh, aberration to the Nummo, and they were very, very um, uh, upset. The Nummo were very upset, very uh, disturbed by the potential that this uh, union could cause their actual individual immortality to be threatened. Uh, you ha- I won't go into how immortality can one immortality can threaten somebody else's immortality, but it can. And this is, of course, obviously something you would prize if you were immortal and you knew it. Uh, regardless of what form that immortality might take, it would be very upsetting to you to learn that that immortality might be put at risk. And so these the Nummo were uh, obviously really, really uh, put out by all of this and could have prevented the further risk had they had an abortion. And it did not occur. We have the birth. And then if you go and you look at the myth, uh, this is really cool, go and look at the myth of the creation of the uh, kings and queens of Great Britain. Go and look at the myth of the creation of any of the ruling uh, royalty families in Europe, uh, Merovingians. If you go all the way back to their um, uh, creation myth, they have at their core, and the Queen of England acknowledges it, that they come from the union of two men, one of whom is a sea monster. And so it's, ooh, you know, it goes all the way back to the Nummo myth as well. They are claiming to be the descendants of the birth of the Ancestor 1 and Ancestor 2, the failure that was experiment number 2, quasi-failure. Let me put it that way, quasi-failure. Because here's what also occurred. Uh, so the the eight ancestors come back to the planet. Uh, they give birth, one and two, produces the Queen of England and all of her ilk. All of those guys are just terrible fellows, and we're still dealing with the bastards. They, they are, have a particular viewpoint that the rest of us don't have, and it comes from that particular uh, mating. Now, after that child was born... The other ancestors went on and created what the Nummo had planned for experiment number two, was that they appropriately mated and created the multiple races of humans. That's why we have all of the races we do, is because there was this pairing that was going to occur in each of the levels that would create um, the genetic um, uh, base from which the experiment number two, the Nummo's grand experiment that would restore their... um, their place in universe, so to speak, because see, they really got thunked on the heads uh, for screwing over the planet and the experiment one and goof, uh, you know, uh, destroying uh, the Earth, and um, and uh, not getting their stuff together here in terms of when they organized their lab work. You know, their notes weren't in order, and so uh, they didn't get any street cred for this. And uh, the other beings in the universe that are also immortal are a little ticked at them, and so they're trying to fix this. And so, uh, to a certain extent, it was quasi-repaired. Now, there's a lot of history that goes between then and now. But we are basically, the all of us that are here today, no matter what race you are, we are the uh, descendants of the original eight ancestors. And this will be brought out in the movie Prometheus, which brings us back to the space aliens and the whole Prometheus um, uh, movie and the ultimate archetype of The Return. Now, see, there's a couple of other bits and pieces of the Nummo myth that surface here and there. Uh, the Nummo were very upset about their spaceship being stolen, and uh, they came back to our area. They may have come back more than once, but w- but there's evidence that they came back at least once. There's also some evidence that they were driven away uh, when they came back, or left voluntarily because they saw that the r- remnant of Experiment 2 had some small chance of succeeding. We are that remnant. We are on our way to evolving back towards the level of immortality that the Nummo had originally designed that we should have. This is not immortality as you may understand it, and it's something we'll have to un- discuss in the future. Uh, but it is immortality nonetheless. And uh, the Nummo would not put that at risk, and so they may have withdrawn. But at the time that they withdrew, after this basically arriving back here for uh, to either clean us up or uh, start Experiment 3, we don't know what, when they arrived, during that period of time there was a confrontation, but it may not have been between us and the Nummo. It may have been between the descendants of the... Um, uh, experiment 1 and 2, the descendants of the sea monster, the Queen of England and her ilk, and the Nummo. Because they actually do represent a threat to the Nummo, where we do not. 
This is why we have this division within the species at this psychic level. This is why we have this division at a trauma-induced level. And this is why the um, powers that be continually use the trauma and the symbology, etc., to destroy our general mindset so that they can rule us all. And it was all set up way back when. And then, of course, you know, as clean and nice and <laughs> and uh, straightforward as that story is, it is not anywhere near that simple. The level of complexity involved in this will stagger us all as it comes out. And apparently it is. The Prometheus movie, I think, is the first of the powers that be getting real serious about letting this stuff out because it's coming out anyway. You've got all these nasty little researchers like um, David Icke and his ilk out there poking in the in the powers that be secrets and they don't like it because these people, once they find a secret, why they go and they blab it all to everybody else. You know, they can't be um, uh, kept quiet. And it's caused a real series of issues for the descendants of the um, inappropriate mating of Ancestor 1 and 2, the descendants of the Merovingian line of humanity. Um, now, are these the Aryans? Uh, are these the crypto-terrestrials, uh, all of that kind of stuff? That's levels of labels and details that I don't think really matter because what I think is occurring, and this is the point of this whole thing today, um, is this whole Wujo talk, is that I think that the movie Prometheus is the beginning of a wide meme that we had seen in the data probably four, maybe five years back without any level of understanding of it, and that I've become uh, more understanding of as we've gotten through it these past couple of years. And that meme we've labeled as the archetype of, quotes, the return, end quote. And I think that uh, at this point, I have a tentative conclusion. Uh, I'm dull-witted and and a slow learner, so it takes me a long time to make up my mind. And so I'll be noodling on this and gnawing on it for uh, who knows how long before I actually say, okay, I'm definitively sure that this is the case. But uh, at the moment, I tentatively think that the movies like Prometheus are going to be a huge attempt to demonize the Nummo. Now, that'll be real easy because the Nummo are ugly. Uh, they're compassionate. They're really good guys. We know they're really good guys because of some stories within Otomele's uh, rituals and because of some stories that, about how they saved us all and some of the stories that the Salish people have up here about the Nemo. But, for instance, the Otomele stories, the Nemo um, are coming around. and See, they came back and they talked to humans. They talked to the, to the descendants of Ancestor 1 and Ancestor 8, who are the people that we call Africans, okay, black, uh, dark skin, heavy uh, melanin concentrations. That was the ancestors of 1 and 8. See, they did their duty. The eight ancestors did their duty after the um, uh, birth for love issue. Um, and they produced all of us. And we know that this is the case because when the Otom- when the Nemo came back at some point in a peaceful manner and talked to Otomele, they told him all the history. They or Not him personally, but uh, his um, ancestors. They told them the whole history. They laid it out for him. And the humans, of course, you know, space aliens arrive. We think they're gods, all of this. Well, look at this. The Nemo are so righteous in their own sense of self that they decried that they were gods. They told uh, the people, we are not gods. We are your creators, but there's a difference. And um, they also said, I mean, they did acts, they reinforced this with acts that you find it casually described throughout all of the myths, and especially in the discussions that Otomele gives about how, for instance, the um, humans uh, the Otomeles, or the, the Nemo, because they are fish, they're aquatic, they spend most of their time in water, they have uh, skin that dries out, they become very uncomfortable in the sun, and they can't walk well. So they have these little, uh, let's just call them um, air skis, the way we have water skis, okay? And so when they get out into the land in area, they can't really walk on it, so they hop on one of these little air skis that scoots around on these little things of rockets. Well, the exhaust from the air skis uh, in a hot uh, vegetative environment was frequently setting the place on fire and destroying the crops of the people that the Otomeli were or that the Nemo were interacting with Otomeli's ancestors and so the Nemo were, were so distressed by this that they altered their vehicles and put these iron shoes on there as the people of Africa described them to protect the people of Africa's crops when the Nemo went uh, to visit, came to visit. Well, this is a cool thing, you know. You're coming in to visit. You don't want to destroy somebody's garden just because you got a, a hot foot, so to speak. And so you alter your foot. Well, get this. 
The humans, uh, still thinking that the Nummo are really godlike beings, they like to emulate the Nummo whenever they can, and we're not very uh, educated, hardly schooled even, and uh, so this is understandable. And the uh, Nummo are shocked to discover that the shaman and the ritualists of all the tribes, whose job it is to, they think, to emulate the Nummo, are, have taken to wearing big, heavy iron shoes. I mean, we're talking giant, heavy iron shoes because they didn't have very much metalworking skills. They were quite crude. And so the Nummo are very, very, very distressed. And so the Nummo call a meeting with the humans, all the shamans, and they say, look, guys, we got something really cool here for you. We're going to tell you that it's not necessary. Please don't do this. You know, no cult of personality here. And if you really want to emulate us, if you just figure you got to, please, Use leather. Don't wear iron. It's not good for your feet. And so uh, that's why we have the, the leather on the, on the feet. And there's a particular kind of leather, and there's all this ritual crap around it. And not just any leather. But, but you get my point. The Nummo are not um, pie-threatening uh, bastards from hell the way the movie is going to make them out. Uh, apparently. I've seen the one alien movie, and I've seen part of the other, and uh, they don't have a very good uh, opinion of... Um, uh, or, you know, I mean, their intent is this fear porn. And so uh, I know that in the movie Aliens, the aliens are not the Nummo. The aliens in this new movie are apparently the this um, uh, scrubbing mechanism that uh, was employed to destroy the and clean up the planet. But you see how they've altered the theme. Instead of the foam coming down and, and destroying all the radiation and sucking up all the poisons that were put out by the liquid copper engine, here we... And, and, scrubbing the planet clean. Here the idea is that the they're going to scrub the planet clean of bad genetics. And so they're, the movie people have interwoven all of the accurate stuff with a bunch of disinfo. Now my issue is, and the whole point of my taking my time and your time to discuss this, is that I think that A, they this is the part of a very large uh, opening wedge, so to speak, of a, a very large movement to demonize the Nummo in a very short period of time. And B, uh, raises a question in my mind of, hmm, why and why now are the Nummo returning? That would be really interesting, because the Nummo don't use these little gates. The Nummo are so powerful that the people that are slipping through these little time stream things, the little gray bastards that are zipping around and all the other issues, as well as the descendants, the Queen of England and... Um, uh, the cult of Rome and all of those Ill, uh, bastards that think of themselves as uh, the descendants of the first mating uh, are going to run into something that we might as well just define as real power, if that is indeed the case, if indeed they are returning. And here's here's a thing. Way back in, like, um, 98, when I first started doing the runs, I kept coming up every time I... We didn't really have the entities described then. They, it wasn't really set up that way. But if we were to think of it that way now, in 1998 and into 99, as I as I moved in and would do the work on what was the powers that be entity, uh, it took various names over time. You know, Bush Co. when it was the powers that be with the corporations, and then the Bushistas when the corporations started leaving the Bush uh, people aside because it was going their way and all of that. But in any event, the powers that be entity at its core has had this thing about fear, and it is not about controlling us through our fear, but it is about something that they are desperately, desperately afraid of. And even in 1999 and into 2000, there was an element of imminency that was creeping up on the fear component descriptors within the array that describes how that emotion is being perceived at that particular time. And so, in other words, the thing that they were afraid of was getting closer. And now we're into a level of immediacy where all I, we're doing is drowning in the immediacy language. We've got the spiders running, and we're going to get working on producing a new report here fairly quick. But I anticipate, uh, just from the early looks at it, that we're going to have to just plow through vast quantities of immediacy language, and it may even demand a new form uh, for the report. I just don't know yet. The point being, though, that I suspect that the powers that be entity, which I stopped reporting on a long time ago because I didn't want to give them a feedback loop of what, what I knew about them, uh, but I suspect that that level of immediacy has gotten to the point of basically it's here and I would think within the next year or so. So I think it's going to be really extraordinary times and maybe our ultimate ancestors and that kind of stuff 
are being demonized by the bad guys on the planet because they want us to get all riled up about these ugly fish beings that are coming back and to tell the ugly fish beings to take a hike when the ugly fish beings really have nothing against us. They're against that less than 1% that is ruling all of us and suppressing everything here on the planet. And um, I'm sure it's a lot more complicated than that. Thanks for your time today. Uh, I've got a lot more about the immortality and some other stuff I've been sussing out and reading on. Uh, we're drowning here in yet another uh, winter rainstorm, and I've got tons of boat work to do. Everybody should really drink kefir, K-E-F-I-R, if you really want to read this stuff. Read about stuff, go and find Dominic's site online. He's out of Australia. You'll know it when you find it because he references the Hunza. Uh, it's really good stuff, and I think things like this need to be done... Um, as a um, tonic, if you will, uh, against the stress and the changes that we've got coming for us. And I do not think that the Prometheus movie is presenting the way it's going to come out. I think it's presenting a projection that the powers that be would really like to have us buy into. So this is going to be a fascinating movie to analyze uh, because of what they've got encoded into it. They're just laying out so much of the stuff, according to what I saw in the Alec Jones a uh, little rant. And then also, hey, pay attention to the words that Alex uses here. Uh, I'm not saying he's co-opted, but he's been mesmerized. And go look up the meaning of that word. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, this is another Wujo. And I hope we have uh, opportunity for many more.